All right, uh, we'll call the meeting to order. Thank you all for joining us. We'll start with this uh, Pledge of Allegiance. <coughs> Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Good harmony there. We are good. Thanks, <laughs> Jim. So, uh, does anyone have any changes to the agenda or amendments? Hearing none, we'll move on to uh, item number three, public comment. If anyone in the audience that would like to make any public comment? Seeing none, I would move to uh, those on Zoom. Is there anyone on Zoom who would like to make a public comment? for any item that is not already on the agenda. Seeing none, we're going to move on to um, item number four. Chip, we'll have you come forward to discuss the four-way stop at Federal and Lower Newton. Uh, to remind folks, we had uh, we approved an emergency ordinance on that for two months, I believe. Um, yeah. And then we uh, tabled it until the school session was in order so we could get a better uh, understanding of what the impacts of that might be on the uh, morning and afternoon traffic. So, Chip, I'll turn it over to you. We still have an active warning for the second reading of the permanent change. And our recommendation is that we recess that again to keep that warning active and to um, have more time to assess it before we bring a, a permanent change back before you. Um, so that's why the first item is recess, recess the hearing on the permanent change, and then we've brought the emergency to keep it going before you. And that, those last about a month. So each emergency ordinance is about a month to keep it alive. But before we make it permanent, we were thinking maybe a little bit more time just to... So you're just using that additional time to right. continue to evaluate yeah. what the impact might be? I mean, and happy to hear what the council thinks. But we well, I'll make a couple of comments since I was the one that brought up uh, what was a vote against having that. Um, I haven't seen uh, any backups. I've seen more people blow the stop sign than I've seen <laughs> cars backing up. Well, it is a stop sign. Yeah. After all. But they're ending up, and I don't really mean blow the stop sign, but I mean just go past it knowing, uh oh, I, I, yeah. I'm too far and I stopped, right. uh, I shouldn't have gone this far kind of thing. Yeah. But it certainly is not the mess I envisioned, um, and it's a little cleaner than I thought it was going to be, so just, you know. Good. Great. I, I would echo those. I, I haven't seen, uh, in my travel, I haven't seen backup like I thought there might be during school, and uh, it seems to, um, in my opinion, it seems to flow pretty well. But, so. I'll make a motion to recess the hearing for a second reading of the ordinance amendment. <coughs> second. I have a motion from Tim, seconded by Mike, to recess the <coughs> Any further conversations? I did just want to say that I was going westbound and stopped and they made a left-hand turn on the federal. <laughs> and someone was coming east on yeah. and, and went right through that sign and definitely that, saw my life flash. That was eyes. actually what we, you, Chad, and I talked about when it first came in. And you, I think you requested some kind of notification down by city feet, somewhere down by the city feet. I keep calling city feet six and stuff down there so that people would know way in advance. Hey, you're going to stop pretty soon, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> that, that might be helpful. Uh, do we need anything for B? I don't think. I just just to continue um, something. Do we actually have a discussion of both? So um, it sounds like well, the the motion that you just made. It sounds like we would you might pass that, and then we would bring it to you to finalize it at the next meeting. If you if you pass that motion to to, to recess, and then we would just bring the emergency ordinance again you tonight uh, before you tonight, just so you can keep it alive for one more month. So yes. Okay, I'll make a motion to continue the emergency ordinance for the four-way stop. Do we? Just a point of order. Did we? We didn't vote on the recess motion yet, though, right? No. So we need to vote on the recess oh, motion. Right. Sorry. Thanks. We're, we're so, that uh, yep. So we have a motion second on the recess. Uh, no other comments. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? 
So that motion passes. Yeah, I'll, motion, I'll make the motion to continue the ordinance for another month. Emergency ordinance. Second. We have a motion and a second from motion from Tim, second by Mike to continue the emergency ordinance. Any comments or questions for Tim? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? Motion passes. Thank you, Chip. Uh, we also have uh, moving on to item number five on the agenda, which is um, the ordinance regarding PHS public health and safety ordinance repeat offenders or violations. Yeah. So we had a second. Uh, we had a first reading, and now we're going to discuss the second reading. <coughs> We, uh, th this change would allow um, the city to find someone for a repeat violation within 12 months of having a safety order issued and, and, and having something under violation without having to repeat the whole safety order process, which just adds an administrative burden and um, kind of creates a situation for city staff or managing property for property owners that aren't sort of doing their due diligence to take care of things on their own. So, uh, you know, it's a, it's a situation where the property owner knows they're not supposed to do it, they've received the safety order, they may or may not have already been fined for it. If they do it again, within 12 months, they should be able to just be fined again. And the safety orders will be altered to say that if you, re regardless of how this pans out, if you repeat this within 12 months, you will be fined automatically. So they would be made aware of that with the first safety order. Questions for Jim? Fairly straightforward. Chad, you good? I'm good. All right, I would entertain a motion to um, to approve uh, the ordinance regarding repeat violations. I'll make the motion to approve the second reading of the PHS, uh, PHSL um, ordinance updates. Is that the motion you want, or do you want to just adopt it? Can we adopt it? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so that we, uh, we adopt, Sorry, the, yeah. uh, adopt the updates with the EHSO ordinance. Second. Second by Mike. Motion by Chad, seconded by Mike. Um, any questions or comments? Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? Hearing none, that motion passes to approve the ordinance regarding EHSO. And we're moving on to uh, agenda number six, which includes zoning amendments. Uh, we have uh, six, six uh, subcaptions to discuss. So we'll turn that over to you, Chip. Yeah, first we have the second reading of um, <clears throat> an amendment uh, related to Act 182. That was a Vermont law that put into place a requirement of that a DRB approval or a permit for a site plan or conditional use had to last for two years before it expired. And we have some instances where a site plan or conditional use might last for less than two years. So this is a situation where we had to update our zoning to be compliant with the new state law. And reviewing the, the current zoning, we actually had, um, it's an opportunity to consolidate everything in the zoning about how long an approval lasts and put it in the same place. So it's basically doing a lot of striking out the language on how long a site plan approval lasts, how long a conditional use approval lasts, how long a subdivision approval lasts, and putting all of that into Article 9. Then we strike out some language in Article 9 to basically set it up so that now we have paragraphs that talk about um, all in one place, site plans, conditional uses. Um, and it's both the DRB approvals and the permits that you get from SARA. You need to get both in order to do something. You need to get your DRB approval and your permit, your yellow card. So we basically, except in a couple cases, said from now on, they all last two years. And if you want to extend it, you can either come before the zoning administrator to extend, or you can go back before the DRB to extend. 
there are a couple places where city council um, noticed there were a couple struck out words that weren't struck out, so I've highlighted those two uh, omissions. So that's, um, that's this change. So no longer considered a construction permit per se, right? Just a permit, because right. it's not always for construction. Sometimes it's for a use or a, a subdivision. So this is the second reading. We had the first one back in uh, August, I guess it was. Mm -hmm. So um, anyone have any questions for Chip? If not, I would entertain the approval of the second reading of amendment related to Act 182. So moved. Second. Motion from Chad, seconded by Mike. Any further discussion? Comments? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? Hearing none, motion passes. We're moving on to item uh, 6B. Um, not sure we did that. Um, we're moving on to the second reading of amendments. See we'll Marty in the meeting. The reformat of zoning district descriptions and standards. Our um, sections of our zoning that have to do with uh, what uses are allowed in which district and what use uh, densities and dimensions are allowed, they're um, currently in these tables, which are really nice, quick reference guides, but most zoning actually has a whole section on, on a district. These are the uses that are allowed. This, uh, these are the setbacks. This is the required lot size. And it just allows you to, it, through the text, be more specific to each district. We have run into some cases where people misinterpret some of the abbreviations or some of the terms on the tables. And it actually you know, leads to a situation where people think the zoning is saying something it's not. So this has actually come up with lawyers interpreting the table when we're under appeal on a decision of the DRB or something like that. Uh, you can avoid that by adopting what most other zoning does and having one section for each district and everything you want to say about what's allowed in that district. So that's what this change does. But the Planning Commission still likes the table, so they've asked that the table also be included and that the text says that if there's any confusion on the table, you look at the written out section and that's the way it's supposed to be. Uh, so that's this change. It, as, as written, um, it should not actually change any policies or protocols or requirements or anything. It just types it out and reformats it into a section for each district. Why do I feel like this is going to come up on Twitter? Man, I don't know. Am I missing something? I feel like I'm missing a good joke. <laughs> I believe the last time we made a clarifying housing change, uh, the city, the city was criticized. Oh, I missed that. We should talk about that later. <laughs> Any questions for Chip? Chip, to be clear, if if there is just because the whole point is clarity, right? So if there is a dis if there is a, a debate or a, a disagreement, it's it, it's really clear that the text governs, not the chart. Correct. Yeah. Um, and I'll point you to exactly where that is. It's um, page seventeen and twenty one. The underlined text around. Oh, it's at, it's at line twenty five. Oh, I see. In the case of any discrepancy or contradiction between sections 303 and 304, the information in section 303 shall apply. Chip, I once again uh, share my concern or displeasure with the... Uh, the two-foot setback? Two-foot setback. Yeah, I made note of that. You know, this one wasn't really about changing anything like that, so... Um, I would if you're yeah. going to put that on I'll a bring that back. discussion. I'll, I'll bring that back. Two feet is not much. No, it's not. I don't know how we got there. That's before my time. <laughs> but it used to be zero, I spoke at one point. Oh my god. No, only in certain sections. I was say my house, my garage was right on the property line. Yeah, that was pre existing. Yeah. That's where I thought yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. This so is for dog house one zero. Yeah. I think I mean, the uh, water business, ran business district and their sub districts were zero 
Well, they are. Yeah, the B1 yeah. actually still is zero. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, but the other ones were. Uh, we had the waiver provision that you could use, yeah. but they were they were never zero in the high density or low density residential districts. Hmm. Yeah. Not in all my years doing this. No. No. Okay. Your so, garage probably precedes zoning. Yeah. My yeah. my needs were on my neighbors. Yeah. For my neighbors. Me too. Property. Yeah. For my house. Yeah. Oh really? Yeah. 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 So future for future discussion. Yeah, I wrote it down. <laughs> I know it is. It's on the list of other things you want to look at, Tim. Yeah. Don't believe me. Long, long list. Believe yeah. me. Okay. Uh, well, can I just add to that? When you do bring that up for discussion, you should also, because we don't have it anymore, we should also bring the waiver discussion back in, because there yeah. are going to be certain circumstances where two feet are okay. Mo yeah. mo I, I agree with Tim. Most times it's not okay, but there are going to be some conditions where two feet will be okay. Yeah. And I want you to be able to consider those. And someone take a look at them with a waiver provision. Yeah, that might be good. I will move that we adopt the uh, amendments to reformat zoning district descriptions and standards. Second. Motion for adoption. Bob, do second. <coughs> Seconded by Bob. Any further discussion on this? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? Hearing none, motion passes. Now we're moving on to consider the adoption of amendments to clarify definitions of dwelling units, unit uses, and rename residential districts. So um, it's actually two, two separate documents. Um, for the dwelling unit definitions, we did get in, in, in the current zoning way it's written right now, it does get a little confusing as to sometimes when it says the word duplex, does it mean there's only two. There's only two families on this lot, or does it mean you you've got like one do, one two unit building here and one two unit building here? You could have six families on one lot, and um, it didn't really address very well a situation where you have a dwelling unit on a lot, but it's a mixed use, so the other uses in the building might be commercial. Um, so we this proposal is to really only use like one term when when we're talking about resident the, the different residential uses in the city. We'll use multifamily dwelling, single family dwelling, two family dwelling. And then when we then in the use table or in the new um, section on district uses that we just approved, there would also be a dwelling unit included where one or more other properly permitted uses um, that are not dwelling units are also on the property. This uh, doesn't seem like much, but it actually clears up some areas of the zoning where I've seen it confuse people. Once again, where it's confused uh, folks of the legal persuasion and we're in the middle of trying to figure out, um, figure something out that's been challenged. So it's good to provide some clarity in that situation. I have, I have a question. Mm -hmm. so under single family dwelling, it's got when a single family dwelling is the sole principal use, but then you've got, this includes when the lot has an accessory use, such as an accessory dwelling unit. So you can have two Dwelling right. units on a single family lot? That's because state statute, in the case okay. of an accessory dwelling unit, forces us to consider the, the, the property as if it's still just a single family dwelling. But you've discussed that before. Right. Okay. Yeah. In regards to parking? In regards to parking, setbacks, <clears throat> and everything. That's that part of this. And then the other one is to, um, we, we've, we've got two main residential districts. One's called low density, one's called high density. And those names are, those are subjective names. Um, we've had a situation where a neighborhood that is laid out exactly like the way high density is described in terms of the size of the lots and the density of the buildings and the setbacks and everything where the neighborhood has come out and said, no, 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 don't reassign our district because we don't like the term high density. And um, I see what they're saying. It's, 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 a na it's a situation where the name got in the way of making the change that actually would have removed grandfathered, made, would have made that neighborhood more conforming today in, in terms of the rules. So the planning commission was thinking, let's just change the names of the districts to reflect something in the standards. 
So we've come up with new names that reflect the lot area that's required to have a single family home. And we'll just kind of go from there. So the low density residential district would become the um, residential 9500 district or the R95. And the high density residential district would be renamed the residential 7500 district or R75. Because you need 9,500 square feet of lot area to have a single family home in one, and 7,500 square feet to have it in the other. So it's a little thing, but once again, like all these other changes, it's something that has come up in the past, and we'd like to just nip it in the bud. What we would used to look for when we were interpreting whether there was high density or low density residential districts would be the amount. Uh, the, the size of the dwelling, how many apartments you could have in it, yeah. um, along with uh, what, what you're stating, and not just what the lot size had to be. Uh, and so now, the way you have the zoning regulations configured uh, is, uh, uh, for instance, uh, in low density, you couldn't have more than uh, a, a three, a, a, a three two. dwellings or two dwellings yeah. uh, without a conditional use approval. Correct. That doesn't change. Yeah. That doesn't change. Yeah. This. Okay. That's right. So <clears throat> it's just the name that's changing. Right. Nothing changes uh, with this other than the fact that the lot size requirement for that district is either larger or smaller. Yeah. So the basis of the name is the size of the lot that's required. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm, not, I'm not really seeing the, the reasoning for the change, but I'm, I'm okay with it because nothing else is changing. So yeah. I mean, correct. I don't, I don't get offended by saying I'm in a high density residential district. I'm not, I'm in a low density myself, but so, I mean, I, I, it's, a, it's a nothing change to me. <clears throat> if it makes these, five, these folks feel better about it, great. Comments, questions? <coughs> so I'll entertain a motion for both aspects of this, which is clarify definitions of dwelling units, uses, and then rename the residential district to what Chip just shared with us. So moved. Second. Motion from Chad, seconded by Mike. Any further comments? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion passes to. Uh, adopt the changes as re recommended. Now we're going to move on to item number seven, which is a public hearing and uh, the need for a resolution for a CDBG application for home repair loan program. I see we have at least two individuals on Zoom from Champlain Housing Trust. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so Chip, I'll turn it over to you. You can do an introduction. So the Vermont Community Development Program allocates HUD CDBG funds from the federal government. And in Vermont, in order to access those funds, you need um, the municipality to sort of go in as the applicant for you. And we have been the sponsor, uh, so to speak, for Champlain Housing Trust for several years now to run a um, home repair loan program that uh, assists, uh, I believe it's low to middle income homeowners deal with repairs in their homes. And it has a, um, a method of paying it back that makes it easier for those homeowners to be able to, to handle taking on that expense, taking on that debt to make the, the repair. Um, the, this application is for uh, $560,000. It's something we've been administrating for a while now. It's, uh, it's the, the administrative burden is pretty low. I don't know if uh, Becca or Julie would like to say add anything to that. Thanks, Chip. That's great. I'm Julie Curtin. I'm the director of home ownership at Champlain Housing Trust. So just um, we're here to answer any questions that the council has and also just to express our appreciation to the city for your years of um, support and sponsorship and for considering this application going forward. Do we have any examples of houses that may have had this done or if we don't want to share that information just some examples of things that someone may have had done like 
porch was collapsing, they put a new porch on. A roof needed to be redone, we did a roof. What kind of windows do we put in new windows for? Did you those two are all, yeah. yeah, sure. I, those are all very typical projects that we do. We do a lot of water heaters, new furnaces, um, new wells, septic systems. So anything that really keeps people in their homes and have it function safely. And um, we propose to do 35 projects with this grant, um, 30 being single family homes, and we are branching into helping um, landlords with this program as well. So we're proposing to do five rental units. Uh, Julia, Becca, uh, Tim Smith, I have two questions. So this isn't, uh, this fund isn't just for St. Albans City. Can you just Correct. clarify that, please? Sure, it's called the Scattered Site Grant, and it's open to um, people in Chittenden, and Franklin and Grand Isle counties. That's our service area. There's um, four other sister organizations in the state that handle the rest of Vermont counties, but that is our service area. Um, it's really one of the only um, programs for low to moderate income homeowners to make these types of repairs. Yeah, and I'll just add, add to that um, a note that we do not cover the city of Burlington with this program. They have their own CDBG funds uh, for Burlington residents. So another question I had, which uh, I'm always curious as to how do we, how do you market this and how do you get the message to the people who really need it? Um, we did a huge mailing campaign back in 2019 that kind of took off, <laughs> just gave us a lot of momentum with the program. So we haven't done any formal marketing um, in recent years just because we were over capacity. Um, but we make sure that we regularly update it on our website. And I think, um, you know, we have town health officers that we reach out to as well to let them know about the program. Um, so I think the grant cycle that we're in right now started in early 2020. Um, and we've completed about 60 projects in that time. I think at least six of them have been within the city of St. Albans and we have another six in our pipeline right now. Thank you. Uh, Chip, do we publicize this on our webpage? Uh, not often as we probably should. Yeah, we will. I think this goes hand in hand with our ARPA program, right? I mean, I don't know if we've had any takers on that yet. But, uh, I, think we, I think we can do a better job of publicizing and getting the word out there for sure. Great. We have brochures too for the program that we can hand out. We can make them more readily available as well. Is the money for the uh, landlord uh, terminology that these folks use, properties, um, before owner-occupied? Because I'm having a hard time trying to get my head around why an income-producing property would be able to have this type of grant money. I will clarify that when a landlord does apply, they have to be renting out um, either a single family home, a duplex, or an owner occupied dwelling up to four units. Um, and the tenants do have to qual make the same income qualifications as this program. If I'm not. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they'd have to raise their rents to pay for it. And if, I, if I'm not mistaken, the state actually um, put that requirement on CHT during one of the grant rounds. Uh, I think CHT was only doing owner occupied when this first started in the state. The state, in in deference to the to rental housing, added that you also must do so. The landlord does not raise the rent. Yeah. Um, and is is there is that contractual or? It is. Yeah. There's a um, a requirement to meet the HUD fair market rents and keep it stabilized. Good. Honestly, we haven't yet done one because it. Most landlords do look at it saying, this is really difficult to go through because of all the regulations. Um, so, for whatever that's worth. Does anyone have any other questions for Julie and Becca? Any questions from the public?
Seeing no um, questions from the public, um, so this is basically um, to approve a resolution. Yeah. Right. So I'd entertain a motion to approve the resolution for the CDB, the, I guess, application for home repair and loan program with Chamberlain Housing Trust. So moved. Motion from Chad. Is there a second? Second. Second from Michael. Any other uh, questions, comments? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? Hearing none, resolution approved. Julie and Becca, thanks for joining us tonight. Appreciate it. Thank get, you. Thank you for your support. Chip will get you what you need. And they should be all set. Thank, Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Uh, now, um, moving on to item number eight, which is the presentation of findings regarding Elm and Lake Street intersection site distances. Uh, this has been a concern of Marie's for some time now. Um, she did email me. She was very appreciative of the fact that uh, we were discussing this tonight. And I do um, so want you to share what you found, Jeff, and then we'll take it from there. Yeah, I mean, it's been a conversation we've had. We've heard concerns from multiple parties about especially the difficulty of turning from North Elm Street onto Lake Street. South Elm is also sometimes difficult. So we had Cross Consulting do the by-the-book engineering analysis of the sight lines. And the yellow and red hatched areas are what should be free of any parked car or any other obstacle um, that you can't see around. Uh, within the distance of that intersection. That would basically, if we were to follow this USDOT rule, this would have us hatching out all the parking in front of Holy Angels and all the parking in front of Almond Blossoms, plus one space across from Holy Angels, and one space across from Almond Blossoms. You know, when we, when we design these things in the city, we're balancing a lot of interests. We don't, we would probably strike a different balance than what you're seeing on this analysis right here. But still, I think it would, we would be hatching out still a substantial amount of parking spaces if we were to follow these guidelines. And maybe not as many as are hatched out on this plan. But it's kind of saying what we thought it would say is that to, to really improve the sight lines at North Elm, we'd have to take out a lot of parking. Um, the, so that's something for the city council to consider. In order to have a four-way stop, we would not have to remove, maybe we remove one or two spaces. If you could see the stop sign with the cars that are parked there now, we wouldn't have to move, we wouldn't have to remove any spaces. So, um, the four-way stop is something that's been mentioned, and, and so this is really just an update on what would it take to just improve the sight lines at the intersection the way it is now versus putting in a four-way stop? And there's also the option of um, uh, not considering either of those and seeing if there's a different solution. So I'll speak just because this is, you know, this is between Marie and myself, probably about halfway. So there's not overall consensus on what should happen with this intersection. I think there's a consensus that it's a, it's a bad intersection. Uh, for me, for several reasons, half the time your, your hood from your front tire out is into traffic, trying to see what's coming up or down Lake Street, uh, depending on whether you're coming off North Elm or South Elm. Um, so it is very difficult. It isn't often, I mean, it's all, it's you know, pretty much the morning on Sundays drop off times. Um, this does, having a four-way stop here would have an impact on two things that I think is beneficial. The first is it's a high use crosswalk area and there's a lot of people that cross there. They're either on the way to the park or they're headed one way or the other. Um, so there are a lot of people that cross here and also um, my complaint has always been people come into the city very fast and I don't think they realize that they entered the city pretty much until they get to Beverage Meyer, and then they go, oh my, I'm going 40 miles an hour, I need to slow down. So this would slow them down before they got to the Beverage Meyer where there are no crosswalks in front of. Um, so um, I think it would take care of that. Two concerns, 
people were not in favor of the one on Lake Street, Catherine, and Federal, and they were not in favor of the one at on, on Newman and, and Lower Walden, but have grown to like them, and I think this would grow with people as well. So um, I just don't want someone, someone to die here. So I've seen a lot of accidents at the end. I mean, but kid brought a little bumper once from a car that had been in an accident and asked the police officer if he could keep the bumper. So, uh, what the officer said? He said he, he came home with the bumper, so he <laughs> said it was okay. So, uh, you know, I just don't want a motorcyclist or pedestrian or something happen at this intersection and have to have someone die before we do something about it. So, and I don't have any concrete data, I just know there's a lot of car parts hanging around that intersection often. I would tend to agree with Chad uh, coming around, uh, traveling that intersection quite a bit that, um, and coming up from the lake, uh, the traffic does, um, uh, does speed uh, up till that point. And um, going to Houghton recently, drop off a kid for football, it's, um, it's tough getting across Lake Street. I think the four way would go and second that. Yeah, there's your public comment right there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So yeah, I would, uh, I would agree, um, open to uh, alternatives. And both, both South Elm Street and North Elm Street, they're narrow. They're narrow streets when you enter onto them. They both have curves on both sides. So, you know, you'll often see people coming off South Elm Street. They're in the middle of the road. So if you're on Lake Street, you can't even turn on anyway until they've come off. And you don't realize that until you've started around the corner, and then you realize, holy smokes, I can't. So then that person's trying to pull off south or north down, to, to, so you've got enough room to get in. So it's, it is, it's, a, it's a weird intersection. A four-way stop would slow things down so people can navigate that situation. Yep. They don't always stop, but it does slow things down. <laughs> I, I would tend to agree also, and I know that uh, Marie isn't able to be here today. And are we gonna, would we resume this discussion when this, this isn't up for a vote or anything? No, it's not. Although... It's interesting to see what Marie would have to say. I suspect she might agree with... Uh, she's, she's, already, she's, she's already emailed me today. She's expressed. You know, we, we could have Public Works look at it, see where if we have places to put stop signs on Lake, what it might look like, and then we could... And we could either just continue the discussion with some info information on that for you next month, or we could actually have an emergency ordinance prepared for you. <coughs> Let's do this. <laughs> There's no need for emergency. Yeah. You want to run the regular yeah. ordinance? Yeah. First reading? I am, I am concerned about where the stop signs are going to go. It's going to yeah, be, we got to look at that. It's going to be tricky. With no bump outs, it's going to be tricky. Yeah. I'm not. I'm really not a big fan of stop signs. Does everyone, everyone remember the movie Cool Hand Luke? Yep. And how he got into the penitentiary by taking yeah. the heads off of the of the parking meters. Yep. I envision myself in another life being a person who takes the stop signs off from the pole using that next stop. You must not like High but, Street. But uh, yeah, like all along High Street. Um, but anyway, missing, we've been missing signs lately. Um, yeah. <laughs> Look at my garage. <laughs> that is a busy intersection. Uh, a lot of people do stop there for other reasons other than stop sign because they are letting people cross on the on the uh, crosswalks. But that probably is your busiest intersection down there, I gotta believe, with those two main streets there. So I'm just not a fan of stop signs, but reality is a reality. Tim, I don't want you to. I don't want to have. You know, what happened with Cool Hand Luke? I don't yeah. Want to <laughs> I think the uh, traffic's increase with the uh, Almond Blossom being here as well, and more cars parking out in front of that, so it does make it a little more, a little more trickier getting across that intersection. So you'll re you'll continue to evaluate, and come back to us <coughs> with yep. something other than a emergency ordinance. Correct. All right. Thank you, Chip. Thanks for all your work. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, we've also been um, uh, program the state is um, is looking at uh, implementing and Susanna Davis is leading this charge from the state. Uh, Dom, you follow that a little closer than I have. You want to touch on that a little bit? So on the <coughs> in the packet, uh, there's a cover letter 
Uh, and then on the third page of the packet, on the bottom right, there's a, a square section that is an invitation to join us. And it says, uh, your community may be a candidate that can deliver a commitment from the local executive, a commitment from the local rulemaking body, and regular active engagement in ideal activities, and tangible action steps and investment. So, uh, to that end, I'd ask the council uh, to consider summing all that up with a motion to appoint the city manager as the delegate to the state of Vermont's ideal program. And I'll let Suzanne know we're in and we'll plug in. Does this require us to do additional things that we might otherwise not do? Um, I don't know yet. You know, I, we have the ability to get out as fast as we get in? Sure, yeah. You know, and I think it's a conversation that we're in, all right? And, um, you know, the, on the, the page before it, we're, um, they're measuring municipalities that have adopted a declaration of inclusion. Uh, well, We've gone further than many in creating a committee focused on this, but we don't yet have a declaration of inclusion. And you know, I just <clears throat> I think we need to be we need to be plugged in to how the conversation is occurring at the state level. And this is the table that's occurring around um, for municipal officials. Um, you know, the league has their committee, uh, which I was on for a while, um, but this is really the one that um, that's being led, and you know. Um, It'd be great to get Ms. Davis here for a presentation. She's a pretty compelling speaker. Um, and you know, honestly, it was some of her, her presentation that uh, inspired my confidence and willingness to get involved. So I find it to be pretty, pretty pragmatic. I'm Don, this is the one that Rutland City got in. Was the first, first municipality to join a few weeks ago? Is this the one that I was chatting with you on the phone about? That's something different. Um, that was something different. That wasn't the wage one. Is that the you don't you no, talk no that was uh, not that the, was around uh, that was around women in the workplace. Yeah. yeah. Okay. No, right. this was like I was calling. I was on my way back from Newport. Yeah. And I called you. And I think this was Rutland City just joined us a few weeks ago. It was the first one. Okay. All right. Do we know what the time commitment is going to be? Uh, you know. Any, any indication of that? I don't get a sense, you know, this is what city managers do, right? They plug in the conversations around the state and bring it back. And, um, you know, with some of the priorities the council set, the work of the DEI committee, this brings resources to those efforts. And, um, you know, there, there's a lot of similarities for the conversations in different communities, lessons learned. Right. So. <coughs> okay. Uh, but, uh, I guess we do want to we do want to vote on it. So all those in favor of having Don follow up with the uh, ideal committee uh, first. Can you be a member? Uh, Ryo, hands up. Oh, it is. Yep. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Thanks. So I just wanted to say, I really hope you guys actually use this opportunity. I think it's a great opportunity for us as a city to move forward um, in this work. Um, Susanna Davis is an incredible leader. She's someone who's worked really hard around the state to make sure that um, Vermont is a place that's um, equitable and that is welcoming and that everyone, regardless of you know th whatever the identity they might have, skin color, um, gender, um, sexual identity, et cetera, that everyone feels welcome. And I, I just hope that um, you know you use this you use this as a as a jumping point for a lot of good work. There's um, the ideal program gives ten thousand dollar grants to municipalities for to continue this work, which is not a small chunk of change um, for any Vermont um, community. And I, I would just encourage you all to to use this as a, as a as a great opportunity to really move this work forward and to um, educate. You know, members of you know your your city council, um, members of the city on the ways in which we can be better um, 
equipped to deal with um, differences. So thank you. Thank you, Rare. Okay, so uh, entertain a motion to have uh, Dom as a delegate from the City of St. Albans to the Idea Committee. So moved. Second from Chad, seconded by from Mike. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? Hearing none, Dom, you were the city's representative to the ideal initiative. Thanks. Thank you. Entertain motion for approval of warrants from 831. Move that we approve the warrants E322. Second. Motion from Mike. Second in from Chad. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? Hearing none, uh, warrants are approved. Moving to the approval of May meeting minutes. Going back to 613. Motion to approve. Motion to approve. Second. Second in motion from Tim. Second by Mike for 613 minutes. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? Hearing none, motion passes. Motion for 71122. Second. Motion from Tim. Second to invite Mike for uh, to approve minutes from uh, 71122. Any amendments, uh, adjustments? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? Any opposition? Oh, 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 oh. Any opposition? Hearing none. Schedule. I don't know. <laughs> motion passes. Thank you, Tim. Uh, so, Minutes from 8-8-22. Motion. Motion from Tim. Second. Uh, you mind? Yes. Second from Mike uh, to approve. Any adjustments, amendments, questions? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? Hearing none, meetings, uh, minutes from 8-8-22 uh, approved. We're moving on to Mayor's report. Uh, Marty, you're still with us. Absolutely. All right. Can you give us a quick uh, figure on how many ash trees you think you're going to be cutting down here in the, in the city here? We've taken down approximately seven, and we've probably got at least another five to take down. All good sized ones, I think, I've seen around around town. Yes. Yep. Yep. Uh, Dom, are we budgeting for future ash tree loss? For the tree replacement program? Well, just not only replacement, but removal of a combination of both. Yeah, we will in the next round. Yeah. Marty, how much do you think you're going to spend on the tree removal? Oh, uh, with everything we've done so far and the ones we have left to do, will probably be around 7000 Okay. And there may possibly be some great money out there because the entire state is suffering from this and how about uh what do we have to be replanted this fall uh we're probably going to do a spring planting this year oh, don't or next planting. year uh, we just need a little bit more time interface with the landowners get the stumps out make sure that it's a good planting with um some of the other things the staff are doing this summer uh we just need a little bit more time so and when we do that in spring, how many are we looking at replacing? Well, we typically do 40 to 50. Um, Marty, I want to thank you for uh, concerts in the park. I thought they all were uh, very successful throughout the summer. I think you had two rainouts or relocations, right? Was that one? Yeah. Yeah, we have good crowds and uh, good weather for 80% of it. So. Thank you for uh, your efforts on that. I just want to make the public aware on um, October 1st is uh, Vermont is Passport Day. So uh, we have the Passport Agency over at the former post office and they are taking general public from our region who may need a new passport uh, for the first time or need to renew a passport. You can go um, between the hours of 8 and 1 and get a new passport. Uh, no additional fees will be charged, so you can just pop in and either purchase or renew your your passport. So it's something they haven't done in a few years. Uh, it's a great opportunity. You leave that day with a passport. When is it? October 1st. So uh, family members, everyone. <coughs> 
Everyone's welcome to attend. And um, what are the hours? Eight to one. Do you leave that name in your passport? You do. Uh -huh. Well, I, I'm quite sure you do. Okay. I, mean, I think it's the same format as before. That passport agency has been a real. Uh, it's very valuable to the downtown. Yeah. It yeah. brings in a lot of visitors from all over the world. So there is a. I go to a. Let's see if there's a website. Um, yeah, so travel.state.gov slash uh, passports, and that will tell you what you need to bring for that. So, photo requirements, documents, other things. So, you will be prepared when you go. So, I want to make people aware of that. And once again, to chip point, uh, I say this all the time, you're all, you're all tired of hearing it, but hardly a day goes by when someone doesn't say how beautiful the downtown is. and the activities and everything that's going on in the community, uh, farmers market, all that. So, um, what uh, Marty and his crew, Chip and his team, with the downtown board, uh, <coughs> and others, um, it all seems to be working and going in the right direction. So, thank you all for your efforts to make that work. I think that was everything I wanted to comment on. Um, let's move to council reports. We'll start with Newell. Newell, what do you have? Okay, Newell has nothing tonight. Marie? No, Marie has nothing. So, Chad? Uh, I don't have too much. Uh, I do want to say the flowers on the poles have been full this summer, so they're up pretty early watering. Um, so, that's been good. Uh, Federal Street looks beautiful. Uh, that was a you know, you don't realize how much of an impact that street really has, but it's, it's very beautiful now. Kingman, too, but I'm like, Kingman, yeah. Um, sorry, that was the one I was uh, And um, the one thing I do want to, and it's pretty low priority, Marty, but um, as you're coming into the city uh, northbound, you get off the interstate access road, you turn right on Main Street, right there in front of Greenwood Cemetery, basically from town school to just past Greenwood Cemetery, there's a whole line of signs, and about four or five of them are tilted at like 60 degrees, and they look kind of odd. So at some point, if we could straighten those up, but that's it. I mean, otherwise, everything seems to be going pretty well. Mike, um, I've got a question for I think Marty. I seem to recall that we had had some success with figuring out how to remove graffiti when we uh, had been tagged in a, a few of uh, our buildings, and I'm wondering if it would be possible to sort of share techniques or, or refer or partner with the two of the churches on Church Street. First Congregational um, got tagged really badly, I, I know, and St. Paul's United Methodist, and I was just wondering if there was any connection or opportunity to offer them some support in getting that removed. I know they were having trouble finding a contractor for the First Congregational that had interest in removing the spray paint. Unfortunately, we are getting better than that. If you want to give them my contact, have them reach out to me and we can help them take care of that. Okay, that's great. Thank you. I'll, I'll pass that along to Pastor Jessica and Pastor Preston. Um, the, I had a couple of requests from the farmer's market. One was that we um, paint the, the red benches along um, what used to be the reflecting pool. And, um, and also, Am I right that the clock uh, out on, in Taylor Park has stopped? I recall us talking about that before. Is there a way to get that it's going repaired. again? Sure. It is repaired now. Thank you very much for that. <laughs> One of the vendors there was like, I'm here for four hours, and it's the same time, and it's making me feel a little crazy. Repaired last Friday, was it? Last yeah, Friday. Thursday or Friday. Sweet. Thank you very much for that. Um, and then, not to make Nicole too stressed out, but uh, ballots are going to get mailed to every active registered voter. Um, before the end of the month, so folks should start to see those appear. Twenty fourth, actually. Yeah. Got the several over emails. I'm, I'm looking what? forward to it, Mike. What ballots? The general election ballots for November eighth. Uh, so at, at, statewide or <clears throat> yeah. So for the for the state, county <clears throat> elections, all the general election offices, so federal. And so the city's gonna have two different ones. We're gonna have ones yeah. for Ward five and six, and then wards. One through four, even have a separate one, correct? That's exactly. So, 
folks got to keep an eye on that to make sure you get the right ballot. You're voting in your right representative. Yes, that's a, that is. And this is handled by the Secretary of State's office. And I, our able clerk, I'm sure, can help resolve issues if folks do get a ballot that is. I've got two correct. sections in my back wall for each one of them. Are you okay. ready to go? Okay, there are I some. I right before. There's a little mix up with last year with a couple, but, or last month, but okay. they were all fixed by election day. Okay, well, there was a lot of changes up in Bob's ward, Bob Tim's. Mine. Yeah, your wards. Ward six only had one, a little, we got, we got an additional piece of paper shoot, so. Okay. Have we had those new maps made up yet? We put it out online. Uh, we printed them up for when people come into City Hall. Uh, would you like us to do more in terms no, of? No, I'm just curious what, what's been done. I mean, we did it digitally, essentially. Yeah, right. So we can print it. <coughs> Good. I have the boards that we used for the last, last election with the new territories and everything that we had right here in the lobby. And then uh, Chip, I believe, printed up the one that we had hanging out here as well. Good. It had been a few years since that was changed, so a lot of people didn't know anything but that. Yeah, so we had a little, we've had a couple of practice practice elections with the municipal in March and then the, the primary, but the, yeah, the difference is that folks are going to have their ballot at home and have the opportunity to, you know, actually look at does the person who's going to be representing them with the new lines is actually on the ballot. And, you know, there is the possibility since this is the first year with the new boundaries that somebody does get mailed the wrong ballot and needs to have that rectified. But you'll have basically 45 days from the time it's mailed to come. So how does that get corrected if someone gets the wrong ballot, they fill it out and send it in? Where's it? Where's that get caught? Yeah. So, so if if someone, so if somebody is is mailed is mailed that ballot and, and it's the incorrect ballot, and it's caught by the 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 it's clerk, okay. well, it, so basically, if there's if it's defective in some way, they'll have the opportunity to cure it before election day. But it's it is possible if the secretary of state's office has somebody listed the wrong way, it is conceivable that someone could vote in the wrong district. But the only office that that would impact is state representative in this case. All the other offices would be the same throughout the city. But that would be like an error that the Secretary of State has in the voter rolls, and I think they've done a, an enormous amount of work since the primary election to make sure that the new lines in the districts you know, are lined up. And what I've seen is that in the voter, the public voter databases, they're all correct. So I, you know, I, I'm knocking on people's doors, I'm mailing people postcards, so I've had the opportunity to check it a lot. And I haven't seen any mistakes. Anything else, Mike? That's it. Bob? As long as Marty's here, I do have a question for Marty, and it's a minor one, but there's a tree that's uh, very damaged at the corner of Rug Street and uh, Barlow. I think you might be aware of it, and it might be on private land. But do you have any uh, ideas about what might be done with that particular tree, if you're aware of it? Yes, I have spoken to the homeowner and put him in touch with the company that we use, and he's got the price on the his plans to get that. So that's on his land, then, definitely? Yes, okay. that's on his side of the side. <clears throat> OK, thank you. Anything else, Bob? Uh, no. Thank you, Bob. Tim? I've got a couple. Um, one, uh, thanks to uh, Tim, uh, Marty, and is it just us who went to meet and Matt Mulherin? And Matt Mulherin. Uh, we met with uh, Keith Tarusky and um, resolved a bunch of issues or brought up a bunch of issues. And it looks like a lot of them are getting resolved, at least from my perspective. Um, and I was, I think that was, it went over very well. Uh, and we'll probably end up meeting with him again. Um, but he seemed receptive to the things that we had to offer. And, uh, and Matt and Marty was just made the, made it go through uh, in a good way. Uh, made him feel that, that he could rely on them to help out and point out things. So I, I think that went really well. Um, 
The um, four lights up in the park, uh, are those gone? Or are they leaving? Does anyone know? I don't know. I don't know if they're still there. Okay, because uh, it's the last few times that I've walked by them, uh, they're almost unbearable. Um, and I don't know if it's because they were full or if that's the way they're, they always smell around that uh, vicinity. Uh, and I don't mean vicinity like right on top of them, but I mean walking on the sidewalk and being able to smell that. Um, and I, I, I just hope that that, that gets resolved. Uh, this, another thing is um, the corner of the sidewalk that is by Planet Fitness and the shopping center, which is um, all broken up. Uh, there's also a track mark, I think it's from the snow plow, the sidewalk plow, uh, that isn't able to navigate that area very well. It's made, a, it's made a, a, about a five inch ditch along the sidewalk, and I think it's a very easy ankle sprain point. Um, and that should get repaired immediately. It's been there for quite a while, uh, probably almost six or seven months. Um, Where is it, Jim? Right on the corner of the planet? Right, plant, right on the, yeah, as soon as you make the turn off the main sidewalk and walk up the planet fitness, it's that, it's that main one right there. So it's, it's, it's on the main sidewalk. Uh, you'll see it, it's very easy, it's all broken up and there's a ditch right, right near there. And I, I think this is the time to be able to make that a little larger so that the plow can navigate that and keep the wheels on the sidewalk rather than on, on the lawn. And that's the only spot. And while, yeah, we take a look at it tomorrow. while I'm talking about that sidewalk, we're, we're in the problematic portion again of uh, the Pomerol properties, uh, uh, picker bush plants uh, encroaching on the sidewalk so that two people walking on the sidewalk have to walk behind each other um, instead of walking side by side. So those should be cut back. And the okay, other I can reach out to. Ernie, they're very receptive whenever we yep. reached out. Uh, so and I, I, I see the guy who usually does it. Uh, he, he mows the lawn for him, Steve, and uh, I, you know, he did it the last time. And it just needs to be yep. done again. It just needs to be done every year at this time. So if he would just put that on his calendar. Sure. The next two items uh, that I have um, are, are not are not good. Um, are not are not easy, um, and they both involve one section of the city and that's Tim's house and the parking garage. Um, a lot of bad things happening in those areas. I've had a lot of complaints. We talked about it earlier, but I, I promised some people that I would bring it up at the full council meeting. Uh, one is um, the residents of Tim's house um, piling up along the sidewalk of the parking garage before they're allowed to get inside the building and yucking it up and, and uh, not having good conversations amongst themselves um, and also blocking off the step down from the city sidewalk into the Derringer. Uh, Derringer parking lot where I've seen those people have to walk all the way down to the shooter sidewalk or what's now city side pub sidewalk in order to, to get into the Derringer uh, parking lot. And that's becoming real problematic and you don't hear about it or see about it unless you're there looking at it. And it's an ugly situation, um, and someone really needs to take care of that. Over the last three or four weeks, I heard of a lot of problems in the garage, and I kind of took that with a grain of salt until I actually drove through it. And I went through it last night about 12:30 at night uh, with my car with the brights on, the bright lights on. There's about 32 lights that aren't working properly that I counted. Um, there's a van up on the, uh, there's a lot of cars that look like they haven't been moved in a long time. And I don't have a problem with that. Uh, there was, when that garage first got built, I got a year pass and, and left my car. Um, I hadn't extended my driveway or made my driveway larger. And I put my car there a lot of times when it snowed out so that the plow would be, it'd be very easy to plow my driveway. And then on the non-snow days, I took my car out, but I paid the fee. So I don't really have a big problem with a car that's been there for a while, but there are a couple cars on there. In particular, there's a van uh, on the top floor that has two flat tires, a motorcycle inside it, all kinds of lumber on the front seats, and it's not going anywhere anytime soon. Um, and, and that 
becomes a problematic for me because it's not a um, it's not a storage site and that's not what we put all the money in there for. Um, on the separate floors, uh, there's a lot of pigeon debris uh, in a lot of areas on every floor. Uh, there's a lot of garbage inside there, and on the very top floor, uh, there was a set of four homeless people uh, that I didn't approach last night, but I did. I was able to count them, um, and that's not what it's all about. Uh, that's not what we put the money in the garage for. Um, I don't see why my vehicle couldn't have been a police cruiser uh, going up on that floor, uh, but it certainly could have been, and it probably should have been. Uh, there's a lot of kids uh, that are playing up there for uh, skateboarding. My understanding is that uh, some kids the other day uh, took a bunch of the pollards off the, uh, off the cement uh, poles and threw them over the top onto the bottom. Uh, that now becomes a hazard to the citizens that use uh, the sidewalks, me being one of them around there. Um, and it's just becoming a big mess. Uh, if we wanted to run uh, an SHIT hole, uh, we could have done it in another way than putting a parking garage there. Uh, but that's an embarrassment. I really PO'd about it because uh, I really didn't want to believe it until I actually saw it. Um, I actually witnessed uh, two kids pull a fire alarm um, maybe a week ago um, uh, before I left and came back. Uh, and I re actually reported it to the fire department, the people that showed up, uh, who they were, and pointed them out. Um, but I think the camera, the, maybe the cameras are poor in there. Uh, the policing in there is extremely poor. Um, and I don't know why anyone uh, in this city or any business in this city would want to park in that garage because I certainly wouldn't. And you know, I'm glad I don't renew my pass anymore. I wouldn't even trust my car in there anymore, I don't think. Um, but it's, it's really a hole. And I'm really disappointed in it after it was such a such a grand thing for this community to have, and for being an elected official in the city, I'm pretty disturbed about it. And I think we should all be disturbed about it, and we should demand that uh, something happens there. Uh, if it is a problem with uh, police not being able to um, get support from the state's attorney's office when giving citations out, uh, then we need to do something about it at the state's attorney's office level and maybe do something about it out of the ballot box. And I'll sit right here on the steps and say it. And, I'm, and I consider myself a friend of Jim Hughes, but I have no problem going up there and talking to him or anyone else <coughs> in his office. Um, so I don't know what the problem is with the city officials or the police department being able to talk to them as well. I mean, are we just throwing up our hands and saying, uh, look, uh, these people aren't gonna care if they get fines because it's not gonna show up anyway. Uh, I don't think that's the strategy to have. Um, we should be proud of that. Uh, we're going to be doing things in the future that's going to have additional parking uh, in this area, and we don't want that to, to spill over into those areas as well. Um, so, um, like I said, I, I, I've always been disappointed in it in the, in the last few months, um, but not more than I was when I drove through there last night. Uh, there's people in there all the time. They're, there are people that are not doing good for the garage, and there's no reason why uh, we can't enforce that. Uh, and I'm willing to do whatever it has to take to appropriate money, budget money, do whatever has to be done to make that place looking the way it should and being safe the way it should be. Because it certainly isn't that way now, and it's a big disappointment. So let Sorry. me speak to a couple of those, Tim. Uh, yeah. The gentleman or the kid that pulled the fire alarm that you pointed out to our fire department personnel, uh, went and spoke to them and of course they denied it. We have them on film, on camera doing it. We've provided that to the police. The police have, I believe, cited them in, it's now in the state's attorney's hands. Um, our, we have staff go through there every single day, cleaning the stair towers, cleaning the elevators and cleaning the decks. Uh, we towed two vehicles out of there in the last month that had been abandoned. The cars that you see that don't appear to be moving have passes and have purchase passes and are either traveling uh, doctors or traveling nurses that just walk to the hospital and leave their cars. We've reached out to two of those uh, vehicle owners and asked them to at least get their car out, wash it and bring it back. But people are, you know, car being 
vulgarities in the dust on the car and everything. So, uh, and the other vehicle that you mentioned on the top deck is a handicapped individual who has a pass for two vehicles. And as state law requires, we have to give handicapped individuals free passes to the garage. That car that's up there, that, that van that's up there on the fifth floor right now has flat tires and there it's it's not even a van, it's not even a, a vehicle, it's a, it's a storage. You can't even sit in but it. But it's, it's, it's registered and inspected and he has a handicap pass for it. Well, there's gotta be something we can do about it and, and I don't know what that is, but uh, I think we need to address it. Uh, anyone in this world that would go up there, other maybe other than that person, would look at that thing and say, "There's no way that's that's uh, a car." I should have took a picture of it, but I did dare you. Yeah, yeah, no, I yeah. I agree with you 100%. It looks abandoned. And it's a storage unit for. Marty, uh, one thing I thought about it uh, throughout the summer is, and I forget to bring it up, is I think historically, don't we pressure wash the parking garage once a year? We pressure wash the deck twice a year, once in the spring and once in the fall. Uh, we do the windows twice a year, once in the spring, once in the fall. And the, the stairways? Yeah, the, the stairways, he, he, we have a water wagon that uh, a staff member will bring up and wash down. And I mean, it's a, like I said, it's a daily event. People are in there and it's, it's um, a challenge. That garage is not functioning in the capacity that we wanted. Therefore, uh, it's it's now functioning as a shelter for homeless people, a skateboard park for kids, uh, a place for drug addicts and drug deals, um, and a place for uh, to to put your car and uh, forget about it and not have to worry about it. Um, it's it's who wants to use it. I mean, we heard, we heard tonight from the staff that uh, at least a couple of times a month, someone's driving right through the, right through the, uh, the, the arms uh, for the tickets, the ticket booths. I mean, something's wrong uh, and uh, it, it needs to get corrected. There's parking garages all over this planet and, uh, and they run well. I think if this thing is, those, all those lights are working, and someone's in there keeping that place clean, all the pigeon crap is out of there, all the garbage is picked daily, um, and the cars that aren't uh, are parking there, uh, uh, that are moved period, that are not moved period periodically are out of there, it's gonna be less of a magnet for these types of people. There's businesses that are around there, there are people that actually wanna use that for the way that it was built, that we spent the millions of dollars of our, of our money on that thing, then we need to be doing something. I don't think we're doing enough. Sorry, I, 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 I don't mean to, to bust anyone's bubble, but that's just the, 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 the way it is. And if people don't believe me, we can adjourn right now with a, with a couple of flashlights and I'll, go, I'll take everybody over there. I'm not making this up. Thank you, Tim. So Don and you and Marty will get together with... with yeah, man. <coughs> We've spoken about it. At staff level, we share the concern. Um, you know, some of the lower hanging fruit, the, the lights, I think we can fix. Um, uh, let me, I'll have a conversation with the police department about our ability to um, prioritize the parking garage. I remember when we had a problem in the park and there are homeless people in the bushes in the park, and there are homeless people making, making uh, use of the rotted out trees. And we went in there with a plan of action, and that changed a lot of the park. And we don't have that anymore. I mean, we, want, we have the occasional homeless person up there. I know I see him in the morning. Um, but, I mean, there's not the damage up there uh, and the unsightliness that there, there used to be there. And the same, course of action needs to be taken for this parking garage. We've got too much invested in this thing. We're using it as bartering for uh, business propositions that we have in the city of St. Albans, and it's gonna become something that is worthless to us if we don't keep it up. I mean, I think the public demands that. So Tim, I would just uh, relay one 
incident that happened with an individual that drove through the gate. Uh, we have him on video and our video cameras are such that we can read the license plate on the vehicle. That individual was cited in the state's attorney, uh, the individual that's running for election this year, dismissed the case because he told me that he wasn't trying to be destructive. He was just trying to get out of the parking garage. And I explained to him that we have call buttons that he could call dispatch and they would raise the gate for him. And all we would like is for him to pay to replace the gate. And his suggestion to me was to take him to small claims court. And I said, you had him right in your office. All you had to say was you pay for the gate and we'll dismiss the case. And he said, that's not my job. So that's what we're up against when we, it's, it, I agree. There's a lot of stuff going on in there, but we need to have some support when we catch the individuals on camera and have video of them doing it, that they're held accountable. Well, then we need, we need to make it known to the general public that we're not getting the support out of the state's attorney's office that we need to be getting. And it's becoming problematic to their detriment. And see if there's some action there. There's got to be something going on. There's got to be something from the police department saying, this is not what we're getting. I know those, those two folks don't like to step on each other's toes, but their job is to make this place safer for us. We pay them. All right, we'll get together and see what we can see what we can do to turn things around. You know, I, I think just to frame it up a little bit, how we measure success. Um, the gates, any, anybody who has a parking garage has to deal with busted gates, right? Um, and some of this just comes with the territory, right? When you talk to any manager of a public resource right now anywhere in the country and they're all dealing with things like this. Um, I think, you know, maybe we can have our police department base themselves out of the parking garage. Um, you know, I think, Tim, your points about the way we uh, put a laser on the behavior in the park 15 years ago, I think is a really good analogy. And maybe we can do that again uh, with the parking garage. Um, you know, and so really what we're talking about is changing the amount of people who are using it for loitering and for recreation and for shelter uh, and not for parking. Right. Um, the the challenge is what's gone on in the country in the last five years has made it really hard to take a tougher stance on managing public assets, right? And so, you know, we run the homeless out of the parking garage. We could very easily get a complaint about why are we being so hard on the homeless? And where are we expecting to go? And Law enforcement's been at the tip of that spear, right? I mean, it, they're reluctant to take that type of an approach because of the political environment. So there are some strategies I can think of that we can deploy, but we, we might get it from, from the other side next. Well, we need to do something. Um, so I won't belabor this anymore, but I did want to leave on a good note. Um, uh, kudos to Nourish, who has taken that Ralston sign um, and those uh, two by two uh, glass blocks and have put uh, lighting behind it. And at night and in early in the morning, uh, it looks beautiful. Uh, re I'm really proud of that building uh, and what that person's done with that. Um, so that's all I have. I'm sorry that I had to bring up some bad stuff. But um, speaking of nurses, we own that building. We do. Are we doing anything with the apartments upstairs yet? Uh, not yet. Okay. In the game plan, probably. It's in the game plan. I think we're going to offer it overnight stays for the people in the parking garage. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any other, anything else for the good of the order? Anyone? We're good. Thank you all for your time. Appreciate everything you do. Most of you are from Chad. Okay. Second from Mike, Bob. Uh, we are adjourned at uh, 7.56.